I, I really want to pick up on something that Michael said in, in his introduction about the, how we're heirs to a legacy. And I have learned recently that I'm an heir to not the legacy of Julius Chambers, though I would claim that um, from in my professional life, but the legacy that I inherited from my family was that of, of opposition to school integration, of trying to stop the implementation to Brown. So I'm going to tell a little bit of my, how I came to learn about this history and how it helps set some context for the years immediately after the Brown decision. Um, so back in, I think, 2012 or 2013, I was taking a class that Professor Tim Tyson does in Durham called The South in Black and White. And it's a, it's a remarkable class if, if it's ever happening and you're able to take it. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's open to the members of the community. Um, but he said something that really, really struck me. Um, in the years immediately following Brown, forces of white supremacy were better organized in the South than the proponents of civil rights. The White Citizens Council was the most successful social movement of the 1950s. This was a, for, as, a as an amateur student of civil rights, this was a really um, powerful kind of revelation. Um, I soon learned that there was an organization that was analogous to the Citizens Council here in North Carolina called the Patriots of North Carolina, uh, described as a, um, as a well-heeled white supremacist organization with about 20,000 dues-paying members that was founded in 1955. Um, when I learned that the Patriots were, had, had gotten their start in Greensboro by, by leading citizens in Greensboro, I got nervous. Um, my mom's family is from Greensboro, um, and my grandparents made no secret of their love for what is sometimes euphemistically called the lost cause. There was confederate and the memorabilia in their household, and, and I knew that my great-grandfather had been a leading citizen in Greensboro. He had been the mayor. He had been on the city council. He had had a very successful insurance business. Um, that's him. Uh, so I decided, that's Fielding Lewis Fry. I decided to try to learn more. I'd never heard anything about this organization. I'd never heard about whether he might be involved. But I went to the archives just down the road at Wilson Library to the Southern Historical Collection. And um, not being a professional historian, I don't know if this is true, but I guess it's not usually the case that the very first folder you get from the archives um, yields results. Uh, I found this letter in that folder from my great-grandfather to another leading white supremacist. Um, in the, uh, to Erwin Holt, who was a mill owner in Burlington. And this was from 1955. So this is a year after Brown. It's hard to read, but I'll, the, the important part. He wrote, I do not know of anything that has caused me as much concern as the Supreme Court decision. It is a damnable thing. Integration in our public schools is something that shall not come to pass. Patriots of North Carolina will be able to render great aid to our state and school officials. The more I looked into the Patriots, the more I kept finding correspondence from my great-grandfather. And indeed, he was um, a founding member and on the executive committee. As, and I also learned that my grandfather, who I did know well, had been an active member and was cons uh, considered for the role of secretary in 1956. So before I tell you more about what the Patriots did to try to stop Brown from ever being implemented in North Carolina, I'd like to try to set the historical context and talk about the state's response in the years immediately after Brown. Um, state leaders made clear that they were for segregated schools in the, in the months and weeks following the decision. Governor William Bradley Umstead uh, issued a statement on May 27, 1954, criticizing the Supreme Court, but urging caution. And here, North Carolina did distinguish itself by, uh, it really pioneered uh, this um, defying the court with a tone of moderation. The Supreme Court of the United States has spoken, he wrote. It has reversed itself and has declared segregation in public schools unconstitutional. In my opinion, its previous decisions of this question were correct. Nevertheless, this is now the latest Supreme Court interpretation of the 14th Amendment. This is no time for rash statements or the proposal of impossible schemes. Now, of course, very soon after this, throughout the South, 
rash statements and the proposal of impossible schemes became the norm for how Southern governors approached the Brown decision. Um, Governor Umstead called on the Institute of Government to prepare a report on possible responses to the Brown decision. Albert Coates was charged with writing a report on, on possible ways the state could confront Brown. Um, Coates's report cautioned against open defiance and instead noted that gradual desegregation could allow for minimal court interference with the schools in North Carolina. In August of 1954, Governor Umstead uh, put together an advisory committee, later known as the first Pearsall Committee, uh, named after Thomas Pearsall, who had been a uh, speaker of the State House from Rocky Mountain. Um, they were charged with coming up with a, a, a plan to deal with Brown versus Board of Education. And I think it's notable that uh, they, they stated as their goal uh, to maintain public schools in North Carolina. The uh, initial recommendations of the Pearsall Committee were to change the student assignment plan. They uh, put all the student assignment authority back on the local school boards and created a very cumbersome administrative process for anyone who wanted to appeal the school board's decision. This really made it very difficult for anyone to get into court to challenge segregated schools in North Carolina. It was a key uh, early innovation in North Carolina in 1955. So any one of those administrative steps was missed, a parent wouldn't be able to get into court to, to sue and, and try to force integration. It also took that authority by taking race as a consideration technically off the books. It made it so North Carolina couldn't be a defendant in the school integration cases, that it really would have to be fought district by district. Um, they also, to make clear that this was not some sort of backdoor way um, that, that might lead to integration. Just to make sure there was no doubt, they also passed a resolution, resolution number 29, proclaiming that the mixing of the races and the public schools cannot be accomplished, and if attempted, would alienate public support of the schools to such an extent that they could not be operated successfully. And uh, later, Governor Hodges made it clear that this resolution was <laughs> important so that his constituents wouldn't be confused about this new school assignment plan or what it was really for. So I've mentioned Hodges. Um, he took over as governor following um, the death of Governor Umstead in 1954. And like his predecessor, he called for calm and moderation. But even more so than Umstead made his uh, commitment to segregated schools very plainly known. Um, <coughs> Governor Hodges began in 1955 a campaign for what he called voluntary segregation. He directly called on African Americans to not follow the NAACP's lead and try to integrate local schools. Um, and this is what he said. Let there be no mistake or misunderstanding about this thing. Those who would force the state to choose between integrated schools and the abandonment of the public school system will be responsible if in that choice we lose the public school system. Effectively, he was holding the threat that integrated schools would lead to the complete abandonment of public education over the heads of African Americans who otherwise were trying to integrate um, the public schools. Um, but, but it's also true that in 1955, the Pearsall, this was now the second Pearsall Committee, one appointed by Governor Hodges, um, resisted attempts by some more conservative lawmakers to begin implementing provisions that would allow for the closure of schools if there were court orders for desegregation. So now I'd like to shift gears and talk about what the Patriots were doing in this time. Again, this is the first year between May of 1954 and um, 1955. And I think hearing this moderate tone really uh, put the, the, the really overt white supremacists on edge, and they felt like not enough was being done to stop Brown, and that's what led to the organization of the Patriots in the summer of 1955. They wanted a more aggressive response to what they called Black Monday. This was the way that the white supremacists in the South referred to the Supreme Court decision. So they took what had been a, a local effort in Greensboro called the North Carolina Citizens League and turned it into a state organization with these 
with these goals. Um, they might be hard to read. Um, in the summer of 1955, they identified 365 charter members from 59 counties throughout the state. Among those uh, were members of the General Assembly, school board members, lawyers, mill owners, and trustee, at least one trustee of the University of North Carolina. They set up local organizations and counties across the state, so local patriots chapters. This is the Alamance County, leadership of the Alamance County branch, um, including, um, this is the president of the patriots, UNC anatomy professor uh, W.C. George, or Wesley Critz George. Uh, and this is the uh, guy who my grandfather, great grandfather was writing to, Irwin Holt, um, a mill owner in, in Burlington. They distributed literature against integration to the General Assembly and local school boards. Um, this propaganda included a report from New Hanover County Schools that showed disparities in the test results between African American and white students. The Patriots took that information and wrote, this proves that there's a wide difference in the native intelligence of the races. They sent out pamphlets such as The Real Truth About the NAACP, which claimed that there were, that was really just a communist front organization. Uh, they argued that the state should join other southern states with the interposition and nullification. And, uh, but their most consistent message, what they really were organized around, was that integrated schools would lead to colorblindness in our youth which will lead to mixed marriages and a mongrel race. And again, I apologize for the language, but this is how they talked about it. So um, they held rallies around the state. The most featured speaker was I. Beverly Lake Sr. Um, he, uh, I think this, it's hard to read, but the, top, the main topic to be discussed was, are we going to have a white or a mulatto posterity? Um, I. Beverly Lake had been an assistant attorney general he argued the Brown case, at least Brown II, in 1955, I believe, and um, became the leading spokesperson for defiance of the Supreme Court thereafter and, and put real political pressure on Governor Hodges. Um, Governor Hodges started to echo his rhetoric to try to stave off what looked like was going to be a challenge um, from Lake to run for governor. Instead, Lake waited four years and ran in 1960. Um, they also had, uh, they brought Senator Eastland of Mississippi for a, a Charlotte rally, where Lake was also a featured speaker. So these, these um, all this activity of the Patriots was really in high gear between 1955 and 1956, though it, it continued somewhat thereafter. And I think the way that this started to really scare local elected officials was when they got involved in the primary elections in 1956. There were three uh, congressman in North Carolina who didn't sign the Southern Manifesto. Um, now, for those who don't know, the Southern Manifesto was a declaration by conservative Southern senators and congressmen that um, called on, that, that called Brown illegitimate and called on all those who signed to pledge their support to undo Brown versus Board of Education. Um, the Patriots organized hard to try to defeat those three congressmen, particularly two of them. I would say the third ended up campaigning as if he had signed the manifesto. He ended up winning his uh, campaign for re-election. But Thurman Chatham lost in the 5th District, and, and the papers at the time understood what had happened. And Thurman Chatham himself said, race issue gave Scott the victory. Um, and they even call out the Patriots by name for the organizing that they did. Um, Charles Dean in the 8th District was the other, other congressman who lost as a result of not signing the Southern Manifesto. Um, so, now we're in 1956, and the second Pearsall uh, Committee got to work, and they put together, um, they kind of reversed course and decided to put together a more strident uh, proposal, but they still couched it in moderate terms and still said that they were complying with Brown. Um, the Pearsall Plan um, was a scheme for staving off integration while, again, appearing to comply with the Supreme Court. It called for a constitutional amendment that would allow for the closure of integrated schools if approved by local referendum. And it had a voucher provision, a voucher so that parents could send their students, their kids, to private schools 
rather than have them attend a public school um, with a child of another race. And again, they were very careful to try to write this all in colorblind language. Um, it also allowed for the creation of local option school districts, which is kind of neighborhood schools on steroids. I mean, it would have allowed them to draw a district around a particular school and say, this is now a district. And because of residential segregation, you could basically ensure that those districts would be very difficult to integrate. At the same time, as the Pearsall Plan was being um, put together, and because it had constitutional amendments as a part of it, it had to go to the, uh, to the voters in September of 1956, um, I, Beverly Lake Sr. put together a competing plan that was introduced by Senator Robert Morgan. And this, the Lake Plan, as it came to be known, went further. It would strike the requirement for public education out of the Constitution. It would allow for the General Assembly to then close schools locality by locality or in one fell swoop if they felt like they were losing um, in the courts. That did, not, that, that, that did not pass the General Assembly. But the Pearsall Plan did. Uh, it passed with overwhelming support, four to one. Um, the Patriots of North Carolina campaigned hard to support the Pearsall Plan. The governor had a, a special committee for the public school amendment that also campaigned vigorously for the, um, for the amendments and for the Pearsall Plan. But surprisingly, so did Terry Sanford. Governor, uh, later, very liberal governor from 1960 to 64. In 1956, he campaigned for the Pearsall Plan. He uh, saw it as a safety valve uh, that wouldn't be used he, he, unless needed. He didn't really say what would be the circumstance under which it would be needed. Um, but he saw it as a way to give the state some breathing room. I will also say that this, the Patriots, the Pearsall Plan, accurately reflected the majority of white public opinion at the time. In 1957, there was an in-depth some in-depth surveys done in Greensboro on the subject of desegregation. Um, to prevent desegregation of the schools, over 77% of respondents said that they would amend the state constitution. Over half would withhold state funds to integrated schools. 44% would close integrated schools. And nearly a quarter said they would use force, if necessary, <clears throat> to keep black and white students from being in the same school. So, what happened as a result of all this activity of the, of the Pearsall Plan, the organization by the Patriots? It's true the safety valves weren't ever used. Um, there was never a local referendum to close schools. Um, as far as I know, no voucher money ended up being distributed to parents. The, that part of the plan was found unconstitutional around the same time the first parents were, were going to get um, vouchers to send their kids to private schools. But as a result of the student assignment power being shifted to the local districts and the, all the administrative hurdles that were put in place and the other elements of the Pearsall Plan, in the decade following Brown versus Board of Education, there were fewer African American pupils attending formerly all white schools in North Carolina than in Virginia or Louisiana, two states that had been much more stridently defiant of the Supreme Court than, than North Carolina. In that same time period, there was more lawsuits brought by the NAACP to integrate schools in North Carolina. Pretty strong indication that um, African Americans in the 1950s did not take Governor Hodges up on his offer to voluntarily segregate the schools. At the same time, North Carolina maintained its image as a moderate state. We were not seen as an Arkansas, um, where there was the National Guard called in to enforce court order. This is a stamp that Erwin Holt started putting on all of his letters in the 1950s. Um, and another, we had another one that was Brotherhood by Bayonet that had members of the army pushing uh, an African-American girl and a white girl together at, at Bayonet Point. Um, we were one of the only southern states that didn't pass an interposition resolution or to adopt legislation aimed at restricting the activities of the NAACP. Um, and in 1957, there were three cities that began what I would call token integration. Winston-Salem, Greensboro, and Charlotte began through the Pearsall Plan to admit a very, very small number of African Americans into formerly all-white schools. Um, I'll just follow, uh, conclude by saying that the, um, 
the Patriots eventually felt betrayed by the Pearsall Plan. They thought that that was going to hold the line and allow for no desegregation of the schools. There was a lot of infighting about tactics. The organization ended up falling apart in 1957. A new group formed in its place with a lot of the same leadership called the Defenders of States' Rights of North Carolina, which was explicitly affiliated with the White Citizens Council. Um, but, but their efforts sort of also faded away by the late 50s. Um, I'll leave it there.